Welcome chemistry students to our chapter on covalent bonding. Here we're going to learn all about why this diagram is so awesome and amazing and what all those things mean. In previous chapters we learned all about ionic bonding and how electrons are transferred from a metal to a nonmetal to form um, a, a family of chemicals called salts and they're always crystalline solids. Um, they have really high melting points, and really, really high boiling points, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other chemical compounds that aren't like that at all, like uh, hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride. It's a gas at room temperature, and water is a liquid at room temperature. And these compounds and all of their properties in general uh, are so different from ionic compounds that scientists just had to figure out why. So what we looked at when we looked at these compounds, well scientists did, is that they're actually forming a covalent bond. So instead of forming those ions and giving up and uh, gaining electrons, they're now instead doing a tug of war of electrons. A tug of war. So I really wish these two would just share because that way we could have a covalent bond. We're going to share valence electrons. Uh, and form that covalent bond. And you probably remember some of this from your biology class. Um, when a covalent bond forms, we end up with something called a molecule, or we refer to it as a molecular compound. And we do tend to misuse that term molecule. Uh, a lot of times we throw that around when we're talking about ionic substances, and we really shouldn't be. But now we can use molecule all we want in this chapter because we are talking about atoms that are joined together because they're sharing valence electrons. And these molecules are going to have uh, somewhat different properties. We're going to have a slide on this uh, towards the end. Um, but they behave differently than the things that are ionically bonded. Uh, you may remember from the lab we did on uh, melting point and solubility that we can tell substances apart. We can tell what kind of bonding they have by how they behave. So there's lots of different ways to represent uh, elements held together with covalent bonds. We can use their formulas um, and the first thing you're going to notice about their formulas is that the elements that are involved are nonmetals. They're all nonmetals. Nitrogen and hydrogen, for example, um, combine to form ammonia and there's lots of different ways that you can represent these space filling molecules or stick and ball molecules uh, models or um, we're working on that in class right now with our Lewis dot structures. Uh, lots of different ways to draw them. And depending on what you're trying to emphasize, one model is going to be better than another. Okay, these non-metallic elements uh, that are involved in covalent bonding, they are going to share valence electrons as opposed to the ionics again, which transfer them over. And some of those non-metallic elements bond with each other to form diatomic molecules. Di there's some commotion back there in the bonding world. And atomic, obviously, meaning atoms. And Mr. Shar has an example of the oxygen. Oh, and Mr. Sustin has hydrogen and chlorine. I was, I was very sneaky he was. <laughs> making my molecules. <laughs> and quiet about it and everything. Yeah. So again, two atoms, two of the same atoms. OK, and we have hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. How nice are. Uh, friend Claire Brewster is hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are all the elements that end up as diatomic molecules. Uh, they're so close to having their outer shell filled that you know they, they really want to get another valence electron. Most of those are the halogens. So they, if there's nothing else to get an electron from, they'll bond with each other and share. So just a real quick compare and contrast between ionic compounds and molecular compounds. You can see here this little T-chart. Ionic compounds involve a transfer of, a, of electrons where two ions are created that are attracted through electrostatic forces. And in molecular compounds held together with covalent bonds, electrons are shared. Again, when we looked at ionic compounds, we looked at those crystalline solids, the different salts we've been looking at. Um, whereas molecular compounds, they can be in any form, a solid, a liquid, or a gas. 
they also tend to have lower melting points and boiling points, or molecular compounds do, than our ionic compounds. Think back to that lab we did where we melted all of those different substances on the hot plates, and we were able to see a difference between those two. Uh, we also did a conductivity lab. Um, we did it mostly with our, what well, we did, our, most of our ionic compounds to see which ones were good conductors. And again, the ionic compounds were, whereas our molecular compounds weren't very good conductors. Right, and that's with our molecular compounds. We don't have particles breaking apart and forming charged particles in solution, so there's no way to carry a charge. Uh, those molecular compounds stay bonded together. So we've given you an overview here of some of the basics uh, in the covalent bonding chapter. Make sure you respond to your homework videos, and we'll see you in the next segment.